Hi, this is Ferran Bandrell. This is the summary for the second lecture of the macroeconomy. This is a lecture that discusses on inflation and unemployment. We look at these topics together because they are connected. There are some theories that they say there is a trade-off between inflation and employment, like for example the Phillips curve. We are going to cover these these theories uh, by the end of the module. Uh, we expect to do that on week eight. However, it's just uh, important to understand how all these uh, concepts like inflation and unemployment are conceptualized, how are defined, how are measured. In particular, in this session, we have seen the measurement of consumer price index or CPI, limitations of CPA and its relation to GDP deflator that we uh, have s we, we saw last week, the cost of CPA for society, measurement of unemployment, we also will discuss on two types of unemployment, structural and frictional, and we will see the individual societal cost of unemployment. So starting from the uh, Consumer Price Index, or CPI, this is a measure of the overall cost of goods and services bought by a typical consumer. The Office of National Statistics, or ONS, for the UK, reports the CPI each month and annually. We have five steps to compute the CPI. We have seen all these five steps in detail during the lecture, so I encourage you to go and look at the, at, at the teaching materials and the examples, the numerical examples. But just to uh, refresh your memory, we have seen that first it's essential to fix the basket, so know which is the uh, goods and services that typical family in the UK normally buys. Obviously they are weighted, so it's, it's the percentage of the income that is spent in good X, which is the percentage of the income that is spent to good Y. Then, for all these possible goods that the UK families buy, then we define the prices, so we, we need to find the prices. Then we compute the basket cost. Obviously if we have the, the basket and we have the prices, so it's basically multiplying and just adding up all these costs. Obviously we will get uh, the, the cost of the basket for many years, then we just choose one of these years as the, as the, base, uh, as the base year, and then we can compute the index, the CPI. And once we have the CPA for every year, then we will compute the inflation rate. Obviously the CPA for the base year is going to be 100, CPA for the other years might just take different values. So the inflation rate in period T plus 1 is it's going to be equal to the CPA in period T plus 1 minus the CPI in the period before, so period T, divided by the CPI in period T, and we multiply all this by 100. Just an example, we, we try here to give an intuition of what's going to happen uh, in terms of the inflation or the CPA between the period 2008-2014, so we know uh, the basket of goods in 2008 was uh, 1,200 euros, the same basket in 2014 was uh, 1,436 euros, so it's possible just to compute the CPI and the inflation, and then we realize that the price has increased 19.7% between these two periods. So that's, that's how basically this is estimated. Moving forward and understanding a bit more what is behind of the CPI, we have seen that CPI has three main limitations. The first one is substitution bias. This is quite clear. When we uh, have an increase in price of one good and maybe the other goods, uh, the price is not increased, then we might just be su substituting from one good to the other. And this changes the basket. Obviously, as long as the basket is fixed, we cannot really control for that. Obviously, the ONS uh, tries to re-estimate every five to ten years this basket, but this is something that is not done annually. So the, if there is important changes in weights, this might be a, an important bias. Other factors are the introduction of new goods or the major quality changes. This is something which is important as well, and obviously requires, again, the better estimation of these 
uh, baskets. The ONS computes the CPI and the GDP deflator. As we saw in the last lecture, we have this uh, GDP deflator. And both of them gives an intuition of how the price has changed. So which is the, the difference between these uh, two ways of measuring? There are two important differences. The first one is that the GDP deflator reflects the prices of all goods and services produced domestically, whereas the CPA reflects the prices of all goods and services bought by consumers. So now that we have a British pound which is uh, relatively cheap, if you want, I mean it's lower than it used to be, then what we are finding is that it's more expensive to purchase the goods coming from the EU, for example, or from the US. All these products are being more expensive, those is generating an inflation in terms of the CPI. Because these products are not produced in the UK, this is not changing actually the GDP deflator. The second thing is that the CPA uses a fixed basket of goods and services whereas the GDP deflator uses the price of currency produced goods which means it's more flexible in terms of the basket and it has a variable basket. Sometimes this is good and sometimes it's not as good because we don't actually control how this basket is changing over time. The society has an important cost uh, with inflation. We have seen that periods of very high inflation are very negative uh, for countries and there are various reasons uh, that are behind these problems. It's important to say that the uh, idea that inflation reduces uh, people's real purchasing power does not need to be true because wages are normally highly correlated with prices. So wage is nothing else than a price for labor. So people real purchasing power might just stay at the same level. The thing is that sometimes some wages are rising large are, are, are rising at a rate larger than the prices and some others might may but might be rising below inflation. That might be one of the problems. The actual cost of inflation is linked to the following issues. So we have the shoe leather cost, which is nothing else as the uh, idea that if there is a high inflation we might keep most of the of our uh, savings in the uh, interest bearing accounts. So well, every time that we need cash, we might just need to the bank. Obviously now, a days with debit and credit cards, this is not as true, but it, it used to be an important reason. The second reason is still quite important, which menu cost, when there is a change in, in, in prices, Firms need to readapt re and construct new uh, prices and new menus for their offerings. There is also a problem about the decision of making decisions depending on the price, uh, how price of one good compares of the price of the others. If prices are growing fast, sometimes it's difficult to make this comparison, so the decisions are not as efficient. There is also the problem of tax distortions. The, the essence of that is that we normally Uh, receive in nominal interest rates from our interest bearing accounts. These nominal interest rates obviously are taxed. When inflation is low, this is not a big issue. When inflation is high, it means that we are just getting to pay some taxes when actually we are just covering for the inflation. So this is this is just creating a distortion. Obviously, there are other issues like confusion and inconvenience, and finally, arbitrary redistribution of wealth. This arbitrary distribution of wealth comes basically from the idea that some of the assets, especially mortgages, are decided or negotiated for long periods of time. So if there is an expected inflation, either the borrower or the, uh, the lender might benefit or might be in a worse uh, position as, as they expect to be. We move now into the idea of unemployment. So each adult is placed of in one of these three categories. So the, the adult might be employed, unemployed 
or not in the labor force, and the employment rate is nothing else than the division or the ratio between the number unemployed and the labor force. It's quite important to separate what is the natural rate of unemployment, which is an employment that does not go away on its own even in the long run, and the cyclical unemployment, which is the year-to-year -year fluctuations. This is linked to the idea of a structural and frictional unemployment. We need to think, just to motivate the difference between structural and frictional unemployment, that most spells of unemployment for most people are short. So we see many people just going unemployed and after a few weeks, few months, getting another job. It takes time to find a new job. We also can see that most unemployment observed at any given time is long term. So we have many people that is unemployed and is unemployed for long periods of time. So friction on employment basically tries to explain this idea that there is a time for sub job search. Okay, so it refers to unemployment results from the time that it takes to match workers with jobs. A structural unemployment is an employment re results because the number of jobs available in some labor markets is insufficient to provide a job for everyone who wants one. Why does it happen? It happens normally because the wage rate is above the equilibrium wage. This normally happens because of three reasons. Minimum wage laws, unions and efficiency wages. We have discussed more in depth all these three uh, possibilities in, in the lecture, so I encourage uh, you to look into that, but just to, to, to bear in mind and to refresh. Just to conclude, uh, it's also important to discuss the cost of unemployment for individuals and for society. Obviously, for individuals, unemployment means loss of earnings and risk of slipping into poverty, especially in the case of long-term unemployment. It affects the self-esteem and the, uh, it might uh, end up in some health problems. Some of the unemployed, especially long-term unemployed, they might go into drug abuse or alcohol abuse, crime. There is a reason, an important reason for family breakdown and obviously there is a, the issue of the skilling. Cost for the society. Obviously if we have more unemployed there is loss of output which is an opportunity cost. There is a tax and benefits effect, so we have lower tax revenues and higher uh, welfare payments. And then we also have the reverse multiplier effect. Unemployment, unemployed to spend less and increasingly buy cheaper products. So this has a negative effect on firms that might end up uh, producing less and employing less people, so generating more unemployment. So this is the summary, I hope this has been helpful and I will provide another summary of lecture 3 next week.